You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today we're going to continue on with our little series. We took a little bit of a break, and uh, we're going to get back into it. And now we're moving on to week four against the Philadelphia Eagles. If you haven't yet heard, I would encourage you to go back and listen. I talked about the Bears, kind of. I didn't do a direct thing like this but the day before I talked about it so I just decided to skip it because we talked about them uh we did week two against the Vikings week three against the Denver Broncos I think it's going to be three pretty tough matchups and I I don't want to go back in time here but I guess a brief summary is the fact that I just don't know what to expect from the 2019 Packers I think if this offense is really able to click not necessarily that everybody just becomes elite and a freak. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if, if the players that need to take a step, take a step, like the wide receivers, and we can get something out of this huge pile of guards, get two quality starters, and everybody else just plays up to expectations, and Lafleur can deliver what is expected of him as a head coach and a uh, offensive innovator, et cetera, et cetera, I think we'll be all right. But these are three tough defenses, the Bears, the Vikings, and the Broncos, regardless of what we think about whether or not they regress. I mean, Chicago Bears, I do expect them to regress. But understand, I'm saying regress from not only the best defense last year, I'm talking about one of the best defenses we've seen in five years or so. So regress, yeah, but outside of the top five, yeah, it'd be a pretty pretty steep fall and a big ask for a team that still has one of the best safeties, one of the best pass rushers. Uh, you know, Kyle Fuller is a, a pretty solid corner. Amuka Murrah is a decent, you know, they, they've got some pieces. And also, let's not forget, Roquan could kind of take a step. He should. I mean, he kind of needs to, being as, as highly, even to this day. You know, he didn't have a great year last year. And to this day, everyone's, oh, Roquan's one of the better guys we've seen and blah, blah, blah. I have to assume he's going to really step up. The Vikings didn't grow very much, but they also didn't lose very much, I think, despite their salary cap not being in great uh, shape. They did a good job of making sure to prioritize to keep their guys in, as well as giving a pretty big contract bump and extension to uh, to Adam Thielen. So at least for one more year, they were able to maintain, for the most part, their core pieces. Uh, Denver Broncos, on top of having some really good players, uh, Von Miller, who, uh, in my opinion, is probably the best pass rusher in the NFL, uh, and then they drafted Chubb on the other side. They've, they've got a lot of pieces, great corners. So we're set up fairly optimally. At Chicago is not going to be great, but then we've got three home games, the Vikings, the Broncos, and the Eagles. And, uh, you know, in, in every single one of these cases, including the Eagles, as we'll talk about, our offense being better than 2018, and I don't want to just take that for granted because I, I think the, the correct way to approach things is, is to start with 2018 and kind of build off of that. 2018 wasn't great. So if we're going to say, yeah, it's going to be different, that's fine. But we don't know that, and we kind of have to have a reason. I mean, do we have a new quarterback? No. Do we have new wide receivers? No. Do we have new running backs? No. Do we have a new offensive line? Not really. We have new almost nothing. But our hope is, well, we got Matt LaFleur, who's going to change the plays, 
and hopefully the locker room will be a little more smileier, and Aaron Rodgers won't be pouting as much, and we're just going to be freakishly awesome. We're going to go from garbage pile to top five because LaFleur has new plays. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying maybe we should temper our expectations, and I am saying that there is reason to be concerned that the first four games we play, real tough defenses. After this, we got the Dallas Cowboys, decent defense. Detroit Lions, eh, they've done some work on their defense. Then we get a break with the Raiders. And man, oh man, if we lose to the Raiders, this is not going to be a happy podcast. And for the third year in a row, it's going to be me just yelling into my microphone about my disappointment and how I should never have done a podcast because ever since I started, everything was just terrible. So please don't let that happen, universe. But anyways, before we dive into the Philadelphia Eagles, please turn your attention to the description below the podcast. I've got every link in the known universe, and I just keep adding more by the month, seemingly. I did add a brand new survey if you'd like to help to uh, help me to get to understand you all, not just demographically, but there's a, a place in there to say what the good and what the bad is. And as much as it doesn't feel great to go and read through all the negative comments, it is pretty helpful, despite the fact that I kind of know it all. Uh, you know, I've heard that before, and there's not a huge amount I can do about it. I'll try to keep those things in mind. It's also difficult when a lot of people's negatives are other people's positives. Right? I hate when your phone goes off and then you go to the positives. Like That's my favorite part of the show is <laughs> when your alarm goes off. I don't know. Can't, uh, can't make everybody happy all the time. Also, rambling too much is a problem, except for some people who seem to enjoy it. So just know that some of you are annoyed by me, and I'm sorry, and I will not be changing. Except sometimes, but not other times. So jump in on that survey and let me know what you think. If you want to get some sweet, awesome, super comfortable t-shirts, there is a link for that next to the word merch, which is short for merchandise, but cool kids say merch, and I'm a, a pretty cool pretty cool cat over here. Plenty of links to support the channel if you're just so absolutely inclined. Uh, be sure to get into the Facebook group. Check out NFLBigBoard.com. I am working on the May update. I think it's going to be a pretty big one. Uh, finally, these lazy bunch of bums are getting around to putting out their big boards and whatnot. And I'm really excited. I've, I've already started the process of uh, going through them and, and watching some tape and some film. By the way, I, I tried this last year, and I did get a little bit of a response, and, and things were kind of on the website side, kind of messed up. But anybody that wants to get involved in NFL draft stuff, just, just reach out, because I have so much work to do. And I know sometimes I don't always get back to you guys, and I apologize, because I have a million things to do. And then even when I remember, I was like, who is that guy? Somebody said something. And then I can't find you because I have 70,000 emails and 65,000 text messages and everything else, and I just can't find you until you reach out again. Like, hey, man, remember me? And I was like, yeah, got a job for you. But I do want to work on getting some summer scouting stuff done. And I, you know, last year was somewhat of a, a trial run. You know, I, I kind of just said, yeah, I want some guys to help me with that. Or ladies, of course, even though, according to my survey, there's only about two of you. But if you want to help, you know, let me know. But that was a pretty good trial and error, and I've kind of honed in on what I'm looking for, because it's kind of funny when you have seven different people doing things seven different ways, and it's like, well, this doesn't look good for my site. I'm honing in on it, man. It's it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be pretty sweet. And then finally, uh, if you have any questions or comments, or, you know, if you want to come right for the site, 608-501-0718, 608-501-0718. And by the way, that does apply to Packernet.com. Uh, that's not really what we do. The The bread and butter is that it's an aggregation, right? The, the the podcast has an aggregator, which is the thing that everybody listens to instead of my podcast, but they think they're listening to my podcast. Which, by the way, if you are listening to my podcast on the yellow and green striped thing, and, that, and, and my podcast is the only one, why don't you just jump over to, to mine? Because then iTunes will, you know, like mine a little bit more. Just a thought. But anyways, no, it's it's... Typically not what we do is we, we got the aggregation stuff, but we have had some people reach out that want to write, and um, for the most part, the, the thing is, we're just, we're not going to babysit you. We, we've got a lot of our own work to do, and you know, when I joined, I kind of just took this podcast thing and ran with it. Nobody told me, hey, I want you to do a podcast seven days a week, 365 days a year, and try to grow this thing to help out the website, you know, whatever. I just decided to do that. That's kind of what I'm looking for from people who actually want to write or contribute to whether it's packernet.com or nflbigboard.com. Not somebody who's going to give me their opinion once, and then I'm not going to email you so you just kind of disappear and walk off into the sunset like every other person has done so far. And I understand life happens, whatever, but just, you know, 
if you 100% want to be, and that's the cool thing. That's why I stuck with Packernet as opposed to something else, because I have the opportunity to day one just be the guy. And I was. I cranked out articles all the time. And guess what? I am the featured writer on Packernet.com by default. Right now, we don't have one. If you want to be that guy, whether it's NFL Big Board or Packernet.com, zero articles being cranked out on either site, you can be the featured writer for those sites. If you're interested, something to think about. The only thing you have to do is, uh, you know, kind of want to work hard a little bit with almost no expectation of anything in return because that's what happens in this industry. You work hard, you get nothing back in the hopes that in several years you'll get a following and then maybe several more years after that you can start making a little money. So, anyways, now that all the uh, I hate your ranting people have already tuned out, we're going to take a little break and we'll uh, get into the content here. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so a quick recap here of the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, again, the general philosophy of what I'm doing here is taking what we know from 2018. Uh, hopefully you know a little bit of something. Let's. I guess we'll take a, we should probably look at it. So for the season, they went 9-7. and seven. Uh, To start the season, they were pretty horrible. It was uh, alternating wins and losses. In fact, they hadn't won two games in a row until weeks 12 and 13. And that's actually a really interesting dynamic, and it's part of the reason why I don't know why nobody wants to give respect to Nick Foles uh, going to ja- the Jaguars. I know Nick Foles isn't anything super special, but Carson, <laughs> Carson Wentz, you know, as good as he was, you know, that one year, the the team, first of all, the team won a Super Bowl with Nick Foles, and then they come back next year, and Carson Wentz takes control, and here's what their win-loss record looked like. Win, loss, win, loss, loss, win, loss, win, loss, loss, win, win. Oh, and then loss. Then Nick Foles takes over. They're basically out of the playoffs, right? They're 6-7 and seven with Carson Wentz. Nick Foles takes over. They beat the Rams. They beat the Texans, two playoff teams, and then they beat the Redskins. And by the way, that's they beat the Rams in L.A. Nick Foles' first game of the season, prime time, in L.A., beats the Rams, then goes or goes back home, beats the Texans, then goes on the road to play the Washington Redskins and beats the Redskins. They squeak into the playoffs and beat the Chicago Bears and then lose to the powerhouse New Orleans Saints and only lost by six points. Now, granted, I think a lot of the, the credit goes to the defense here, keeping the Rams to 23 points, keeping the Redskins to zero, keeping the Bears to 15 and the Saints to 20. But still, I mean, the, the, the defense was pretty solid with Foles as well. Or excuse me, with Wentz. In fact, hilariously, before the bye week, the only games that Carson Wentz won were games in which the defense kept the team under 20 points. Tampa scored 27. Uh, the Colts scored, excuse me, the Titans scored 26. Vikings scored 23. Panthers only scored 21. They lost all of those games. The only games they won, the Falcons scored 12. The Colts scored 16. The Giants scored 13. The Jaguars scored 18. The only game that Carson Wentz, who is the quarterback of the Eagles, won last year in which a team scored more than 20 points was the garbage New York Giants, who managed to score 22 points, and Carson Wentz and the Eagles scored 25. So I actually think that's kind of important because when I'm looking at this team, I I think my perception, and I think maybe other people's perception of the team, is a little bit more positive than it should be on the offensive side. I think when I think of the Eagles, and again, I, I can't speak for you, but just in case you think like I do, I think of, you know, maybe two years ago when it was Carson Wentz and Zach Ertz, and they, they you know, this was a pretty pretty big powerhouse of an offense. They could move the football, but as I'm looking at it now, and, I, you know, I, I don't want to jump ahead too far, I think the, 
the Eagles' offense is closer to the Tennessee Titans. What up, dance party? Stop making people mad all the time. Get out of here. So rude interrupting. I think they're closer to the Titans than they are the Chiefs. Well, Chiefs are a bad example. Closer to the Titans than they are the Rams. Or the Saints, we'll say. Whatever. I, I don't think they're, they're necessarily a powerhouse. I just think they're kind of good across the board. And that's kind of what the Titans are. Right? There's a lot of, you know, good, you know, good players. No real bad players. And, uh, you know, outside of Travis Kelsey, who's probably the best center in the NFL, there's no real great players. But anyways, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. i got to take a step back. So that was 2018. And that's 2018, remember Carson Wentz, the, the 2018 version of the Eagles in which they ended the season really strong, went into the playoffs, knocked off the Chicago Bears. That was sort of that Nick Foles magic slash... Um, the defense who doesn't get any credit because the, everybody wants to talk about the wonderful story about Nick Foles. Which, by the way, before we get all like, oh, see, it's not Fo-. Dude, he's going to a team that has a great defense. It's a very similar situation. That team is all about running the football and defense. Nick Foles just needs to go there and be not a garbage Blake Bortles quarterback. No offense, Blake Bortles, but it just is what it is. And Foles can do that. He can be that mediocre guy who just does what he's supposed to do make intelligent decisions and accurate throws to guys that are open, and just keep moving the football. And the defense will keep most of the teams under 20. Occasionally, a team will score 25, and Foles' job is to make sure that you get 26 or more. Most of the time, he'll probably do that. A couple times, he won't. That'll be a loss. We'll be all right. We'll still get into the playoffs and have a pretty good chance of moving into the playoffs because it's all about defense, largely about defense at that point, and they have a great defense. So there you go. There's my uh, my two seconds on the Jaguars, which also upsets people when I talk about other teams. But you know what? It's a daily podcast. You're going to get a lot of different stuff. Anyways, man, I am extra ranty today. This is this is uh, this is something. From 2018, now we got to kind of build on that and say what's different about the team. We obviously know the quarterback thing is kind of different-ish. But looking at their free agents, guys that they lost, DJ Alexander to the. Uh, to the Jaguars, Nick Foles to the Jaguars, linebacker Jordan Hicks to the Arizona Cardinals. And that's kind of a big one. Jordan Hicks is a good football player, and he's only 26 years old. That's a pretty big loss. And again, I don't want to skip ahead, but since I already gave my my uh, my thoughts on the offense, the offense is, is probably somewhat similar, but with a, you know, a, a better head coach, so the plays look better, the design is better, and a slightly better quarterback than they have in, in Mariota. But as far as the players, I'm, I'm calling them the Titans. The defense kind of reminds me of the Vikings. Real good, real solid, focusing on the you know the the guys up front, but also starting to erode and doing their best to just keep the guys that they've got so that it's not just a complete uh, landslide and everybody just completely disappears. But Jordan Hicks is a pretty big loss for their defense. Uh, they lost wide receiver Jordan Matthews to the 49ers. Jordan Matthews wasn't anything super spectacular, but I don't necessarily love their wide receiver group. So it's one of those things where you kind of don't care. I've talked about this with other teams, other position groups or whatever, where it's like, he wasn't that good, but at the same time, you look at the group and it's like, we really can't afford to lose people from this group. Now, they did add Deshaun, but we'll get to the additions in a little bit. Either way, I wouldn't want to have lost um, a wide receiver. And then on top of that, they lost Golden Tate. So there's going to be a bit of a decline with their slot receiver. They still got Nelson Aguilar, but I don't think anyone's going to tell you Nelson Aguilar is up to the standard of Golden Tate. So that one's going to hurt a little bit. However, Jordan Matthews was replaced by Deshaun Jackson, so I think that's probably an upgrade. But then they've got Haloti Nada, who retired. And again, that defensive front is kind of what their whole identity is about. Um, going into even last year, they already had a front four that was solid across all four. And then they added um, uh, Michael Ken- or excuse me, um, Michael Bennett. So it's like, man, these guys just keep... Oh, and Haloti not. I think they added both of those guys. So you already got four guys that are just solid, and then they add two more. And it, it you know, for a lot of people who are looking at the Packers' defensive front going, why are you adding so many guys? That's kind of the trend now. You, you get the minimum, and then even the depth is quality depth, not just whatever, because of that rotation. So it's almost like a front four, in reality, for starters, is like a front six. And you want as many quality guys as you can have in that entire rotation. But anyways, they did lose Bennett, uh, linebacker Leroy Reynolds, who's more of a special teamer, but still another linebacker. They've got several free agents that are still unsigned, running back Jay Ajayi, who they're probably not going to be re-signing, but you you could argue that they're taking a step back because they signed Jordan Howard. Lateral move, however you want to define it, that's still not great. Jay Ajayi was kind of a 
one of the focal points of the offense. Uh, safety Corey Graham still hanging out there. Running back Darren Sproles, another running back. Um, wide receiver Mike Wallace. A lot of these guys are pretty pretty old. Corey Graham is like 33. Darren Sproles is up there. Mike Wallace is up there. I think they're just kind of, Jay Ajayi is probably only like 26, but a lot of these guys are just kind of letting the age walk. And then along the offensive line, Chance Warmack and Stefan Wisniewski. Uh, Chance is just not a very good guard. Uh, Wisniewski, though, not terrible. He didn't have a great year last year, but I don't know. It's kind of weird that he's still hanging out there. Nobody wants to even take a flyer on him. He's like 30, but still. Then they've got some other low-level guys that they released, one of them being Chandon Sullivan, who's actually the only one of this group that got re-signed, uh, the guy that the Packers signed. They did, however, add a few players, so we'll kind of go through those as well as their draft picks, and then we'll kind of take a little break and look at uh, specifically their offense versus our defense and their defense versus our offense. But uh, along that defensive line, which again, they lost several players, and it's one of their biggest things. They added maybe the, you know, rumored to the Packers for quite a while. We were all real excited about it, but out of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Malik Jackson. Um, and it, it, I think this is one of those situations where because he's the biggest name in free agency, everyone assumes he's just an absolute freak. And Malik Jackson's pretty solid, but he's not like super elite elite. Uh, for, for being a six foot five, 290 pound man, he's actually not the greatest run defender in the world. However, he's he's a pretty solid pass rusher. I mean, he's almost exclusively a pass rusher, and he's 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 getting to the passer at twelve point three percent. So he's up there with Mike Daniels and and Kenny Clark in that respect. So you can see why the Packers are after him. I mean, that's exactly what the Packers are looking for. Although it'd be nice to get a guy that's a little bit more well rounded and not exclusively a pass rusher. But um, but even that, I mean, it, it, it looks like he just had one bad year, twenty seventeen and prior. He was flying against the run. So probably a uh, a pretty good pickup for the Eagles there. Uh, other quality additions, Andrew Sandejo at safety from the Minnesota Vikings. Sandejo is a pretty good guy. Uh, also along the defensive line, Vinny Curry, uh, who last year was with Tampa Bay, but prior to that was with the Philadelphia Eagles. So he knows that. And uh, he actually was pretty solid. He, he had a bad year with Tampa last year, but he was pretty solid with the uh, Eagles prior. Pass rush percentage was 13.6 in 2017, which is really really good so they lost some guys but they're they're again they they just keep stacking that defensive front now that's unless this little drop off with tampa is more indicative of where he's headed at you know 31 years old last year he had a 8.8 ish pass rush percentage which is kind of garbage but we'll see hopefully he's not panning out because i don't want to have to go up against a defensive front that looks like what it sounds like and then they also added zach brown linebacker out of washington Guy's always been pretty solid, but last year with uh, Washington, the guy was just a complete complete freak. So he was okay with Tennessee, pretty decent against Buffalo, went to Washington, had a pretty good year in 2017, then 2018. Um, we're talking one of the best linebackers in the NFL. So again, we'll see what he can do, but uh, hopefully last year wasn't a sign of things to come because he was very, very, very good last year. Outside of that, they signed uh, Louis Perez from the Birmingham Iron, Greg Ward, wide receiver from the San Antonio Commanders, and Charles Johnson, wide receiver from the Orlando Apollos, which is pretty hilarious. And then I mentioned uh, they had several trades. They traded for Deshaun Jackson. Uh, They traded away Michael Bennett. They traded for uh, Jordan Howard from Chicago. And then they also got uh, made a trade with the Indianapolis Colts for another defensive tackle, this time Hassan Ridgeway. So, again, the other thing that I think is kind of cool, as much as it seems a little confusing, it's nice that we have a defensive coordinator that seems to be on the, I guess, cutting edge. As silly as it might sound, it's funny that the things that I started seeing Mike Pettin do, I'm starting to see a lot of other teams do, and I'm not saying Mike Pettin is the innovator here. What I what What's cool is that when he took that year off, he spent his time, you know, he worked with the uh, the Seattle Seahawks, but he said he also spent time kind of researching and, and finding out what's going on around the NFL. So you, you listen to him talk about his hybrid front. Pretty much every team in the NFL now is running that sort of hybrid front. Again, not because he's an innovator, but because he's not like we had before with Dom Capers. Where it's like, no, I run a 3-4. And he, he ran some hybrid stuff. He did some different things. But it was all Dom Capers. It was, it was from the mind of Dom Capers. What you see, um, what you see Mike Pettin do is staying at least at the forefront of the innovation throughout the NFL, right? Why are we stacking so many along the defensive line? We've already got defensive tackles. We keep adding defensive tackles and and guys on the edge. 
you know, how many guys could we possibly need there? We're set. Why don't we go get a wide receiver or whatever else? This is kind of what teams, this is what, you know, if you look at the good defenses, the Vikings are not scared to continue adding defensive tackle talent or defensive, you know, defensive ends, whatever. The Chicago Bears are not afraid to add guys along that front over, you know, constantly. As much as it seems silly to talk about trenches, 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 like that's old school football, but look at the Eagles, look at the Jaguars, look at the Vikings. You know, the Colts went out and invested a ton. The Patriots are always adding guys along that front. And teams that don't have it are teams that want it. You look at the Raiders, they want to add guys along the front. You look at, uh, you know, Matt Patricia, who came from that Patriots defense and, and went to the Lions. What is he doing? He's adding defensive front, defensive front, defensive front. The Colts, who had a good defense, what are they doing? They're adding defensive line, defensive line, defensive line. So that that's the way the NFL is going, and Mike Patton is, is already ahead of it and we have a gm that's supporting that as well which is awesome but anyways we'll take a little break and then we'll look at their tennessee titans offense against the green bay packers defense all right so just kind of top to bottom there's been a lot of turnover with their wide receivers but as i said what they have right now is alshon jeffrey deshaun jackson and nelson Aguilar, which is actually a pretty solid group especially when you factor in that they've got two really good receiving tight ends not super elite um i mean guess i guess we'll see Zach Ertz, obviously, is still very, very good. Last year wasn't his best year. Uh, He was graded as the eighth best uh, tight end. However, they also have Dallas Goddard, who was in his first year the 10th best tight end. So if if Zach Ertz can still stay there or even rebound a little bit, we're talking about two guys that are not only top 10, we're talking top five potential type tight ends on a team that has Alshon Jeffrey, who's sort of the Devontae Adams type, not in terms of his talent, but in terms of just being that... Um, the, you know, the, the X wide receiver, you know, the, the quality route runner, the guy who's going to get the, the 10 targets in a game, whatever. And then you got Deshaun Jackson, who's sort of our Marquez, who's the speed guy that's going to stretch the field and Nelson Aguilar as our, you know, our slot guy. So again, with the two tight ends, it's a pretty solid group if they can put it all together. And Carson Wentz doesn't have a super hard job, especially with his decent offensive line to be able to just distribute the ball and make this thing work. So the potential is there, but again, we're not talking about super elite players. It's just a lot of really quality players. Ertz is good. Dallas Goddard is good. Alshon Jeffrey is good. Deshaun Jackson is good. Carson Wentz is good. Uh, Jordan Howard is good. I would say Ertz and Goddard have the potential to to kind of break into that, you know, very good. I don't know about elite, but that very good territory. Also, Car- Carson Wentz probably does too. We haven't seen it in quite a while. I don't know if I believe it anymore. But we've seen it in the past, so I don't want to completely discredit them. Um, offensive line is pretty solid. I mentioned they did lose a couple Peter uh, Peters, did lose a couple people, but Jason Peters at left tackle has been one of the best in the business for a very long time. He, like the rest of the team, I mean, the, the, the team as a whole kind of took a step back, and it's similar to the Packers and some other teams where something was just wrong, and I don't exactly know what it was. I don't know if it's the Carson Wentz issue, and there was talk about. Him not being the most likable guy, he even, if I remember correctly, almost came out and like apologized, like, you know, I, I don't remember. It was kind of a weird, funky, kind of locker room dynamic situation going on, but uh, he's also very, very old, so it's possible this is just a, a decline. He, he ranked 38th in the NFL, which is not good at all, but prior to that, I mean, we're talking about a guy that's been, you know, one of the best left tackles in the NFL for a very, very long time. The left guard situation, because they lost several guards, I don't know exactly what is going on here. PFF has Isaac Somelo, uh, Suamalo, whatever. Currently as their left guard, that's a problematic situation for them. However, being sandwiched between Peters and probably the best center in the NFL, a guy that took a pretty big step back from 2017 but was still graded as the number one center, just to give you an idea of how good he is, um, not a terrible situation for that left guard to be in. And yeah, Travis Kelsey is just an absolute freak. To his right, Brandon Brooks at right guard, very, very good right guard. And then uh, Lane Johnson at right tackle is a very quality right tackle. So across the board, um, with the exception maybe of their left guard, fantastic group. C- kind of similar to the Packers in a way. Left tackle, center, and right tackle are, are really where the, the meat of this thing is. And they've got a quality right guard and a questionable left guard, which I think, you know, if the Packers can figure out their guard situation, that's probably pretty similar to where we're going to be at, just with not quite as good of a center as Kelsey, but their their left tackle is nowhere near as good as ours. So we'll call it about even. But I think either way, as much as I said I don't necessarily respect the team, I think this is a formidable opponent compared to what we've seen up to this point for our defense. I think the biggest difference here, though, is 
whereas other teams like the Vikings have some really good wide receivers, so it's like, man, we really got to be on our P's and Q's. I don't know about this group. I think the tight ends could be problematic um, because of the mismatch that they can create. But talking about, you know, Alshon Jeffrey against, I don't know who, probably Kevin King or Tremont Williams or whoever gets put over there, and Deshaun Jackson, and, and we'll see, but, you know, with Deshaun Jackson's speed, I would probably think that uh, Jair would be the guy to, to put on him. And maybe if we've got Josh Jackson still on the slot, which I'm not a huge fan of, but the Packers seem to like that idea, I think he can handle Nelson Aguilar. So the tight ends I'm a little more concerned about. The wide receivers, though, I think we can handle. The The difference here, though, is what's gotten me excited over the, the last several weeks is the defensive front's ability to get consistent pressure on the quarterback. What worries me about this group is the offensive line is pretty solid. And they also have enough weapons and enough mismatches with their tight ends that if we're bringing heavy pressure, I think that they can kind of take advantage of that a lot. I think they've got a great opportunity between, you know, Alshon Jeffrey being a pretty good wide receiver, Nelson Aguilar in the slot, two tight ends, to be able to consistently dump off the passes. If we, Again, if we're bringing heavy pressure, it's opening up some areas around the field to be able to get these little dump offs. And the problem is when we back off, if we do back off, that's when they have opportunities to start hitting guys like Deshaun Jackson or, or Zach Ertz or Dallas Goddard down the seam or kind of hit some of these big plays. So I really think the guys up front have to do a good job, uh, slash Mike Pettin needs to do a good job of finding ways to bring pressure because without it, they're, we're, we're kind of at their mercy. And then we have to rely on the guys on the back end to be able to defend because Carson Wentz is going to have some time. The one good thing, though, that I really like, and this is where you start looking at guys like Savage and even guys like Amos who are seemingly just, you know, Amos doesn't have the speed that Savage does, but his intelligence, if you watch some of the clips, it's all about his speed. Some of his biggest highlights are about how quick he is, but it's not quick like Savage is quick. He's different. He's quick mentally, right? He, he's processing what's going on, and he breaks on something really, really fast, and it makes him look like he's running at 4 3 9. But I think the speed of the defense is really going to be highlighted here because, again, if we're bringing pressure and they're trying to do these quick little dump-offs, the, the problem is space, right? So the guys are all pushing forward. And, you know, you got Deshaun Jackson who's running down the field, which is stretching the safeties backward, which creates a lot of space in the middle of the field. So having guys like Amos and like Savage and like Oren Burks to have that kind of speed to close, it, it means that there's not as much space as it might seem. So those are the kinds of situations where, okay, Carson Wentz feels like there's an opening. He's going to be all slick about it, like, oh, you're going to bring pressure. I'm just going to dump it off to Ertz. Well, Savage sees him looking at Ertz. Ertz is open. He waits on on Carson Wentz to kind of start cocking his arm back, jumps the route, and that's, you know, obviously I'm just having a little little fantasy moment over here where I'm just trying to think about something awesome that's going to happen in this game. But that is generally where that speed comes into play. It, you're, you're essentially covering more space on the field. Whereas a guy like Blake Martinez, if you, if you just think about a circle drawn outwards in terms of how much area can he cover by the time a pass is thrown, let's just say, in his general direction, the size of that circle is going to be much smaller than Darnell Savage because of his processing speed as well as his just football speed. You have to be kind of far away from Darnell Savage because he, he can get there fast. So I, I think this could be a, a, a tough matchup. Again, not because they have super elite components, but because they have so many good components across the board. It's not going to be easy to get pressure because they've got a good offensive line. I don't know that they have any super elite wide receivers, but they've got enough quality wide receivers that our guys have to really be on their game because even if, let's say, okay, Jackson's on Aguilar and Alexander's on Jeffrey and King's on Jackson and and they're really, really just doing a great job, you still have two tight ends and a running back that you have to account for on these plays. And all it takes is Zach Ertz going up against, you know, Adrian Amos and just, you know, running a good route. Amos drops the ball, figuratively and literally, I suppose, maybe. And that, that accounts for a play. That's one of the negative things about being a defensive back. You have to be perfect all the time. And that one time you make a mistake is a completion. So it, it's kind of interesting because on one hand, you look at it and go, I don't think that their offense is all that super elite. We don't have that much to worry about. On the other hand, you look at it and say, somebody's really got to step up in this game. This is kind of where you put that defensive front to the test. If they're able to overcome this offensive line and get consistent pressure, I think we're going to dominate their offense. If we can't, we might be in a lot of trouble because, again, they have so many receiving weapons. I mean, when Nelson Aguilar is, you know, he's not a great option, but when he's your fifth best receiving option, that's a pretty solid unit. You know, when we're talking about 
I don't know, Dallas Goddard is your fourth best or Alshon Jeffrey is your fourth best or whoever you want to put as your fourth, that's pretty solid. And then again, you know, say what you want about uh, Jordan Howard. I think he was a pretty solid running back. I still think it's weird the Bears got rid of him, especially since they got rid of him and went and got David Montgomery, which, I, again, I don't want to go on a rant for the Bears. I just don't understand that. Well, Jordan Howard, you're, you're not versatile enough. We need a guy that can be a bit of a receiver. Also, we're going to be drafting a guy that's just a running back and not much of a receiver. Also, I just realized I forgot to talk about the draft picks. Speaking of draft picks. So, oh, here we go. This is quite interesting. So what I had forgot is they actually traded up ahead of the Texans pretty masterfully because the Texans were almost absolutely going to take this guy. And because they didn't, and what I'll do is I'll just talk about the offensive guys because we're talking offense. We'll try to make it look like I meant to do this and probably just shouldn't have told you that I didn't mean to do this. But the Texans were absolutely pro- absolutely probably going to take Andre Dillard, but the Eagles traded up one spot ahead of him to pick 22 and took Andre Dillard out of Washington State. Now, I don't think we're going to be going up against Andre Dillard. I really don't. However, Jason Peters, as I said, is getting quite a bit older, and if he's still playing at the level that he did last year, it's possible we'll be going up against um, Andre Dillard. However, I think that's sort of best-case scenario. I think the odds that Andre Dillard comes in and is in, is a you know top 10 or even top 15 left tackle in the NFL by week four is very very unlikely, and if you know if we're to the point where it's kind of close as to who's going to be playing, that means Peters isn't doing too well. I think that's a great situation because the entire left side, because again their left guard isn't very good, that entire left side is going to be exposed and open to just consistent pressure on Carson Wentz. So either way, it's probably a good pickup because even if Jason Peters is here for, for another year and, and we think he's going to be solid, it gives us that, that future left tackle that we're going to need eventually. So again, I don't think we're going to see him, but I kind of hope we do because that tells me that they don't have a very good left tackle, and that's fantastic news for a team that needs to be able to get pressure. At pick 53, they got Miles Sanders running back out of Penn State. I, I really don't know how that's going to break down in terms of who gets what carries, but that's you know he's a pretty solid guy. I would expect Jordan Howard to still be their, you know, general, you know, first and ten. He's the guy that's on the field. Miles Sanders maybe just brings that different dynamic. I guess what we could say is that Jordan Howard is the new Jay Ajayi and Miles Sanders is the new Darren Sproles. If we had to break it down that way, that's kind of how I would see it, I guess. At wide receiver, something interesting, Mr. J.J. Arcega-Whiteside out of Stanford. Now, I do think it's going to be hard for him to get on the field because I don't think he is going to supplant... Uh, Alshon Jeffrey, as much as you know, Alshon isn't exactly an elite wide receiver, I still would be surprised. I think J.J. Arcega-Whiteside is decent, and I, I listened to a, a podcast yesterday, one of the guys is an Eagles guy, and they were, they kind of sounded almost like Packer fans, where it's like, oh man, we got Dallas Goddard, Zach Ertz, and now J.J., look at all the size on this team. It's like, man, we said the same thing. It, it, who cares? It's, it's just a question of, are you a good wide receiver? So yeah, it's, it's sort of like they've got three big tight ends now. And I think maybe when they get down into the red zone, it could be problematic because I think he's that kind of a guy. But for the most part, I don't think he's really going to be on the field all that much unless they're just you know, spreading the ball out or spreading their wide receivers out doing five wide or something, then maybe. I guess I don't know. But he's, he, you know, he's not going to go in the slot and replace Nelson Aguilar. I don't think he's going to replace Deshaun Jackson because it's an entirely different skill set. Why would you take Deshaun Jackson off and put in this slow, lumbering, giant, tight end looking guy? And again, I, I just don't think he's going to be as good as Alshon Jeffrey. So I, I, you know, as much as you might look at it and go, oh man, they got JJ now. It's, I, I just, I don't know that we're going to see him all that often. And if he's going to go out there and be the big giant go up and get it guy, that's just going to run a, a you know, a, a nine route straight down the field. I'm going to put Kevin King on him and he's not going to get a single ball. But, uh, and then they got Clayton Thorson at quarterback uh, in the fifth round. So um, considering the injury history of their quarterback, it's possible we see Mr. Clayton Thorson at some point. I would guess not by week four, but uh, who knows? Because they don't have anybody else. They lost Foles. And unless Nate Sudfeld or uh, Luis Perez is better than Clayton Thorson, it would probably be Clayton Thorson. And again, given Carson Wentz history over the last couple of years, uh, Clayton could be playing in the playoffs already this year. We'll see. But anyways, that's, that's more or less uh, how I feel about that, I guess. Again, the overall theme, I don't know. Relatively confident. I think the biggest question mark and concern that I have are mismatches. I think we're going to be in a lot of dime personnel because of the amount of tight ends that they have, and we don't want to be mismatched, although Oren Burks is basically just going to be a coverage uh, linebacker anyway, so maybe it's not exactly dime if you got Oren Burks and, and uh, Blake Martinez out there. 
but I think making sure that they're not, uh, you know, taking advantage too much. But that's, you know, that creates problems where we, we go too light and then they're trying to run the football. So that's where you also need to make sure that the big guys up front are handling their business in run defense, which is awesome because, again, rather than doing what I wanted to do, which is go out and get, like, D Ford type guys, get Justin Houston type guys and draft Brian Burns type guys who cannot or, or probably aren't very good or as good against the run, we got Rashawn Gary, we got Preston Smith, we got Zadarius Smith. So not only do we have a front that can rush the passer, but if you decide we're going to try to run it down your throat and we're going light with our dime package, which is what our defensive coordinator wants to do a lot of the time anyways, that's fine because these guys are big, giant, monstrous, 275-pound you know, defensive ends. These aren't you know, 250-pound outside linebackers. These, these are big guys that can hold the edge if you try to, to, try to run the ball you know, with Clark and, and Mike Daniels in the middle. So it's not a matter of these guys are just going to get pushed out of the way. We'll get up to the next level, and we're, we're dealing with, you know, Blake Martinez and Darnell Savage as the other linebacker, and we're just going to steamroll everybody out of the way. I don't think it's going to – if that's the plan, I don't think it's going to go the way that you think it's going to go. So, again, that's a situation where as I'm recapping what the Packers did, I'm seeing why their plan was probably a lot better than my plan because I'm as I'm walking through this, I'm saying, okay, if we do this, they do that. So then if we do that, then what they're going to try to do is do this. And I'm looking at their plan going, yep, your plan was a lot better than my plan because they're going to try to run the ball. They're not going to be able to with, with uh, Gutekunst and, and Petten's defense. They probably would have had more success against my defense. So anyways, we'll take our final break, and then we'll come back and look at uh, our offense going up against their uh, new powerful – well, not new. I mean, it's somewhat new, but still a powerful defense. So first things first, looking at their final draft pick uh, in the fourth round, they only had five draft picks, but they were uh, rounds one, two, two, four, five. So they're all guys with potential to contribute. But uh, take a wild guess what position they drafted, the one defensive guy they drafted. Well, Sharif Miller, defensive end out of Penn State, was their draft pick. So again, this is 100% their philosophy, and it does seem to work. But what we'll have to see, because you look at it, um, it kind of just depends how guys pan out. They, they did lose quite a few players. They still have Brandon Graham, who's very, very good. PFF has graded him as basically elite for the last three straight years. And then Fletcher Cox, who was about one of the best defensive tackles in the game. He's graded as the second best last year. Um, he's been elite or close to it for about five years. He's been three out of the last four years graded as elite. 2016, he was very good. 2014, he was very good. The guy's just about as good as they come. So as much as we might look at the Bears and, and talk about their front, I think the, the Eagles have it a little better. I, I think Brandon Graham as a defensive end is arguably better than Khalil Mack, even though nobody wants to talk about Brandon Graham. Now, as a pure pass rusher, Khalil Mack's going to be better, which is probably why. But just an all-around, well-rounded uh, defensive end, uh, Brandon Graham is, is a freak. So I guess what I'm saying is just don't underestimate them. Don't just think, well, you know, when we play Khalil Mack, everybody freaks out, and then it's like, well, I don't really know any of these guys, so who cares? Brandon Graham's pretty legit. And then Fletcher Cox, um, you know, again, as much as we want to talk about Akeem Hicks, Fletcher Cox is miles ahead of Akeem Hicks. Not only, you know, I should say, overall he's better, but specifically, as I said, Hicks is, is very, very good, mostly as a run defender and a decent pass rusher. Fletcher Cox is a fantastic pass rusher from the inside, but also you're not going to be able to run on him. So to give you a little bit of insights, uh, Brandon Graham, who I said is is uh, really, really solid and, and is probably a better well-rounded football player than Khalil Mack, he's getting 12.5% pass rush percentage, which is, you know, we're talking Zadarius Smith level pass rush, not so much Khalil Mack, but again, super well-rounded, very, very talented guy. Um, 88.4 was his overall PFF grade. That's a lot higher than the Preston and Zadarius Smith grades overall. So um, also pretty solid in coverage, which is strange. Didn't do it all that often, but when he did, he was pretty good at it. And then Fletcher Cox, who, I, as I mentioned, is just about as good as they come. 15.3%. That's higher than Khalil Mack. Meaning as far as pass rush goes, you should be more concerned about Fletcher Cox than Khalil Mack. 15% is insane. He had 101 total pressures last year. 11 sacks, 25 hits, and 65 hurries. For context, um, Zadarius Smith had 61 total pressures. Fletcher Cox had more hurries 
than Zadarius Smith had sacks, hits, and hurries combined. Fletcher Cox is a freak show. And remember, they added Malik Jackson next to Fletcher Cox. And as much as Malik Jackson, again, as a well as as, as an overall guy, whatever, but still we're talking about a twelve percent pass rusher. So you've got twelve percent Brandon Graham, twelve percent Malik Jackson, and fifteen percent Fletcher Cox. This is a scary, scary front. And then the unheralded or underheralded Chris Long. Uh, is also a 12 percenter. So they, similar to the Packers, are 12 percent across the board. We have one guy that was at 13 percent. They've got one guy that's 15 percent. So their defensive front is as scary or scarier. I don't know exactly if they have the depth. They've got a lot of different players. They they, they definitely have enough to rotate. It's just a matter of once, and I'm not going to go through their whole defensive line to look at their percentages and whatnot. I don't really care. But uh, all these guys up front, m- most of them, if not all of them, have some abilities against the run it's going to be really, really tough. And then again, remember they added Zach Brown at linebacker. Now he's been super up and down over the years. So I don't know for sure what he's going to bring. Again, he was number three overall last year, 2017. He was graded as below average. So he was elite in 2018, below average in 2017. Um, You know, going backwards, good, good, terrible, average, average. So all over the place. Uh, Their other linebacker is Nigel Bradham, who's kind of, I guess, mediocre, and then when they're in their base and they've got three linebackers, the third would be Camus Gruger Hill, uh, Gruger, Gruger. I think it's Gruger. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's not very good. So this is where the the sort of good news comes in. Um, you know, their linebackers are questionable. Their cornerbacks are questionable. Their safeties are okay. So this could be a pretty frustrating game. And again, it comes down to what is our offense. If our offense is is like peak Packers, everything's really clicking. You know, the, the scheme is going great and everything's just really going awesome. I think we'll be all right. I think there's enough here, especially when you look at the wide receiver to their corner matchups. Devontae Adams is going to destroy whoever they have. At, at this particular point in time, I believe Ronald Darby is going to be their top guy. He was graded as the 38th best corner last year. He's been kind of, I would compare him to like the Alshon Jeffrey of cornerbacks. He's, you know, good, not great. Probably not even quite as good as that. If you have a super high opinion than Alshon Jeffrey, then just scratch that. But I'm, I'm just saying he's he's okay. He, he can hold his own. I, I would rather him be like my number two as opposed to my number one because guys like Devontae Adams are just going to absolutely destroy you. Uh, Sidney Jones, who – Sidney Jones is one of those guys who was thought as – and this was back in the that year in which there was like the greatest cornerback draft of all time. And some thought Sidney Jones was the best of that group, but he was injured, so he fell, I think, into the second round. The Eagles took him, and the thought was he's not going to play year one, but he's going to come back and be a freak. He's had two horrific years, so there's a part of me that's a little scared of him, but he's been really, really terrible. And then you got Jalen Mills, who's also a, a not very good cornerback. And then as far as coverage goes, one of the things Zach Brown did well, and again, this depends on if he's going to be consistent with what he was last year with the Washington Redskins, but he was very good in coverage. They don't have anybody else that's very good in coverage at at linebackers, so maybe exploitable, maybe not. I really don't know. It depends, again, on Zach Brown. I would assume what the Eagles are going to want to do is, is focus Brown's energies on coverage, leave Nigel Bradham. Uh, to kind of handle the linebacker. I mean, it's not like Brown's going to completely abdicate his, his duties, but he's going to be focused primarily on, on the pass because they trust their front. And that's 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 the big point about all this. Coverage is the most important aspect, right? That's we we got to make sure because everybody's throwing the football, we got to make sure everybody's able to do their job. But we can't abdicate our, our, our front. We have to be able to stop the run, and also we got to be able to bring pressure. That's why if we can have four guys or five guys along our front – that can handle that responsibility, and we don't have to have two or three linebackers there to also help with stopping the run and everything else, and we can utilize them more so in the pass game, get smaller, more athletic guys, or just use safeties in those spots, we're going to be a lot better off. That's Again, that's what the Bears did. The Bears were so successful because their front four handled everything. The, the Jaguars, why are the Jaguars? Because their front handles everything. The Eagles, their front handles everything. What are the Packers trying to do? They're trying to make it so that our front can handle everything so that we don't have to worry about having freakish linebackers. right? I mean, you know, we want great linebackers, but not just these run-stopping, you know, type of guys. Now, if you're going to be a good linebacker, you better be able to cover, or you're just not a good linebacker in the NFL today. That's all there is to it. 
that's like saying you're a great defensive tackle, except in the whole, you know, rushing the passer thing. You're just a good run stopper, right? Like Snacks Harrison, one of the best defensive tackles in the NFL, except he's just exclusively a run stopper. He's not a very good pass rusher, so he's not very respected in the NFL. He's not, like, if you were to rank best defensive tackles in terms of, like, teams, if they could just pick, you know, like, if we were just doing a draft, he would get picked way lower than his overall value because they weight pass rushing so much more than run stopping. He would be out, probably outside of the top 10 despite being easily one of the top 10 most impressive defensive tackles. So anyways, that's going to be their focus, I would assume, is is I think every team wants to start with the, the most basic, right? We, we want to be able to just control you with our front. Our job on offense is to say, sorry, that's not going to cut it. You're going to need some help from your linebackers. You might need some help from your safeties. Unfortunately, that means our offensive line is really, really, really going to have to step up. Our running backs, what up, dance party? Our offensive line and our, our running backs are going to have to really be able to step up and, and take some chunks. Because if we can expose them, which really all, all that means, if, if they're just trying to get home with their front, and it, it's easier said than done, but if you think about it, if we're running outside zone, and let's say we're stretching out to the right, Brandon Graham and Malik Jackson might already be outside of this. Right, they're, we're already running past them. They're they're pretty much out of the play. All we really need at this point, you got say Lindsley pulling out to the right. You got Billy Turner. His biggest job is going to be to make sure Fletcher Cox doesn't get penetration into the backfield, which is again easier said than done. But if he can just do his job, we've got Brian Balaga, Corey Lindsley, and you know presumably a tight end, all kind of out in front. And again, if they're going light with their linebackers, you know Corey Lindsley might have to go out and wall off. Um, Chris Long, and then you've got Balaga and, you know, Mercedes Lewis, who are working on linebackers and safeties. You know, Balaga is probably already up at the next level taking out Bradham, and that's sort of what I mean. If, 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 if our guys can just do their job against the two guys that are really going to be tough, like Fletcher Cox, and trying to keep him from getting penetration, and maybe we go the other way, then we have a running back who just needs to be able to make things happen. We have blockers trying to make things happen against smaller, you know, stop the pass type guys. So you, you just you got to make them pay for that. They're being disrespectful. They're saying we don't need big guys at linebackers. We're just going to focus on the pass because you can't get to us anyways. So you know what you have to do? You have to get to them because then they start crowding up. Then they start getting bigger. And that's when we sit back and say, okay, now you really messed up because you've got your garbage corners and you got your big lumbering linebackers that can't do anything against our, our, our tight ends. And a couple of mediocre safeties with uh, Rodney McLeod, or McLeod, I don't know how you, I think it's McLeod, and, and Malcolm Jenkins at strong safety, both of whom are good, not great. And again, it really just comes down to if the Packers' offense is up to expectations, and my expectation is we're, we're back in it, we're back to, you know, whatever, 2013, 2014, we can move the ball, Aaron Rodgers looks solid, everything's fine, Devontae is a freak, good offensive line, you know, Scantling and... and uh, and EQ all took a step. Geronimo has a role. Fantastic running back in Aaron Jones. Jimmy Graham kind of rebounds a little bit. Mercedes learns how to block again, back with his old offensive coordinator. He remembers that whole thing about blocking. And Jay Sternberger also plays a pretty big role. Th- this is a very beatable group, right? It's really just a scary front and then a bunch of beatable guys. But we got to beat the beatable guys. Again, 2018 Packers, which is our starting point. I don't know that they can beat this defense at all. I think we're kind of just doomed. It's game over. The 2019 expectation is that I'm a little worried about the front. There's going to be some sacks. It's going to be kind of scary. But for the most part, we should be able to distribute the ball. We should be able to take a couple chunks here and there in the run game. And it should be enough to be able to move the sticks. And then it just becomes a matter of can our defense... Um, you know, get consistent enough pressure on Carson Wentz, and can our cornerbacks hold up, and you know, cornerbacks and safeties hold up against a uh, good, not great receiving group. Maybe a couple greats. You know, we'll we'll, we'll give the tight ends a little bit more respect. But um, yeah, and again, it's 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 going to be tough, and I'm very excited to see what this group is because the you know, even though we've got a, a home stretch, which is going to be to our our benefit. These are the kinds of games that are going to instill, instill confidence. As much as we can look at it and go, well, they were they were a nine and seven team, and with Carson Wentz, they were what? What did I say? Six and seven. It's still a good group, and this is still the kind of defense where if the offensive line can hold up, we've got a good offensive line. If our if our if our offense can just move down the field consistently, if we can run against this front, 
I feel real good. If we've got a defense that can stop the, the Eagles offense, despite not being an elite offense, you still feel good about it. Because a bad defense can't stop Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson and Zach Ertz and, uh, you know, Jordan Howard and Dallas Goddard. You know, a bad defense just can't stop that. A good defense probably can. So all these are just going to be interesting tests. And it's, it's going to be tough because it's still September. So it's going to be one of those things where it's like, yeah, we learned something, but did we really? But either way, it doesn't matter because all that goes out the window. Our opportunities are at the beginning of the year when we have all home games. We have to stack wins. I don't care if it's September. I don't care if it's June. I don't care what month it is or how prepared you are or think you are. You better perform. And that's kind of where the head coach comes in and making sure that they're ready. And to be honest, I kind of like the way he's going about stuff. I like that he's kind of, I don't really care the way you used to do things here. I know tradition and all that is very important, especially for the Packers. You don't want to erase that. But, you know, you start hearing things about he's, he's denying access to the media. As a fan, you want the media in there just because I'm, I'm, I'm bored and I want Packers information. I need it. Right? I want to hear every bit of news. I want to know every pass that was ever thrown in practice. But from a practical standpoint about winning football games, if it's going to give us even a slight edge to not have the media in there as a, distra- as a distraction, number one, and as, you know, insight, number two, we're doing private stuff. Look, man, just 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 grind. I mean, if you just want to shut down the media, lock the doors, and just grind, 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 because it's going to help you be more prepared for September football when you have all your home games and need to stack a bunch of wins and also want to build confidence so that when you go on the road, you are a very good defense and a very good offense, and you're already kind of, you know, you're a couple steps ahead of other teams who are still in preseason mode, and you're halfway to getting, getting uh, you know, postseason ready. That's what the Packers have to do this year. And that's a big ask for a team that's got a bunch of new players and a brand new, you know, head coach, brand new offensive coordinator, second year defensive guy. I mean, it's it's funny, they're leaning on Mike Pettin to be sort of the leader of the coaches, and he's sort of the the second year guy around here. Gutekunst is a second year GM. But the way that they have to do this, based on the way the schedule makers set it up, you gotta hit it real hard early, which is gonna be tough, considering all the newness. You gotta stack a bunch of wins. You gotta start solidifying who you are and what you are as a team because second half of the year, you're on the road a lot. And you have to be able to win on the road a lot because that's when it gets to the point of who's going to the playoffs and who's staying home. And if you're just losing, 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 all those wins aren't gonna count for anything because the Vikings and the Bears and teams like the Eagles and all the other NFC teams are gonna start stacking wins toward the end of the year as we're losing. We're gonna fall out of the playoffs and it's game over. Stack wins with that stack confidence and be ready because it, it, it's sort of basically like the, the postseason starts early for the Packers. Real hard games on the road and you just got to win them. By midseason, it's, it's like the Packers are already in the postseason and you got to start winning. You got to hopefully keep winning. So games like this are going to be tough, but games like this have to be won. You have to be able to beat a, you know, a nine-win football team. You have to. Because after this, you got the Cowboys on the road. That's not going to be easy. After that, you have the Lions at home. Should be easy, but it's probably not going to be. Week 8, you've got the Kansas City Chiefs, and Week 9, you've got the L.A. Chargers. Those are not easy games. Week 10, Carolina Panthers, eh. After our bye, six games, only two of them are at home. 49ers on the road. That's a long trip. you got to go all the way to the West Coast. Then after that, you got to go all the way to the East Coast and play the Giants. Maybe not the best teams in the NFL, but that's a lot. Then you go home for the Redskins. Then you have to play the Chicago Bears. That's very, very tough. Then you have to go in Minnesota. Then you have to go play Detroit in Detroit. Three straight divisional games in a row, only one of them at home. And it happens to be probably the best team in the NFC North. If we aren't playoff ready, by the time we come out of our bye, we will not be in the playoffs. If we look anything like that 2018 team coming out of our bye week, we will not be in the playoffs. If we were not able to stack wins, again, against the Minnesota Vikings, Chicago Bears, Denver Broncos, Philadelphia Eagles, Dallas Cowboys, Detroit Lions, Oakland Raiders, through those first seven weeks, we're in a lot of trouble. Because again, Chiefs, Chargers, Panthers, then a bye, then we're on the road the rest of the year, ending the year with three straight divisional games. We have to stack wins early. And the Philadelphia Eagles are smack dab right in the middle of it all. All right, they're, they're not the Chicago Bears. They're not the, the, the Chiefs. This is, this is sort of the mediocre slash good kinds of teams that you have to be able to beat at home 
if you're going to be able to do anything, right? This is similar to that game against like the Washington Redskins last year, where it's like, okay, this needs to be a win, and then we lost, and it's like, well, that's not good because we need wins, and this is one of those ones where we we should be able to win, so that when we lose to teams like the Rams, it doesn't hurt as much. You know what I mean? But but we lost it, and that's that's really bad. So, anyways, I got to get out of here. Got to go to work. You folks enjoy your Thursday. I'll be talking to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.